cheaper than our producer's underage sister, edgier than the stuff shown on late night television. Newer than Kim Kardashian's ex, live from Orlando, it's Crazy Train Radio. Hey folks, on the line now, we actually have a former left winger, very, probably best known for playing with the Philadelphia Flyers, Brian Prop. Proper, what's going on, man? Uh, just uh, busy as usual with work and uh, hoping that the, the NHL lockout will end fairly quickly. Oh yeah, well we'll definitely be getting into the lockout for it. For sure, but I actually want to jump in talking about your career, uh, though. Uh, well, first of all, you were just talking to me off air about the judge group who you work for now. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, I've been with the judge group for three years, and we're a global professional services firm, and we specialize in technology consulting, enterprise-wide staffing, uh, corporate training, mobility practice, unit communications, and we also have a human capital management division. So uh, we can help a lot of companies uh, that have a lot of needs, and, and we are global, so that uh, makes it uh, you know, a very viable company to be dealing with. Uh, well, you guys are based, the judge group, at least the division you work for is based out of Philadelphia, correct? I am uh, based out of the uh, Center City office, which is in the Comcast Center downtown Philadelphia. Our headquarters are in Conshohocken, Pennsylvania, but we have 30 offices in the U.S. We have offices in China and Canada also. Well, definitely, you know, got to love Canada because of your hockey background, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot uh, going on in Canada, especially with the oil and gas and uh, the mining industry and uh, everything that's been going on there the last number of years. It, 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 uh, they need a lot of help. Business has been good, that's for sure. But uh, anyway, you were actually drafted, if I remember correctly, uh, number four or fourteen, correct, in nineteen seventy nine by Philadelphia of all places. That's correct. Yes. So uh, you actually came in at a time where they still had some pretty heavy hitters with them, such as uh, Reggie Leach, Bobby Clark, and. Bill Barber and others from those uh, Broad Street Bully days. Uh, any good memories with those guys? Oh, you yeah, have tremendous memories with uh, you know Clark and Barber and Leach and McLeish and uh, Frank Bath and you know there was a, a ton of uh, great hockey players on that team. And uh, you know we had the 35 game undefeated streak on my first year uh, as a rookie, and we went to the Stanley Cup Finals that year. And so there was a lot of great memories because. The older players had won uh, uh, in 74 and 75, so they were very good about uh, mentoring me and helping me as we uh, we continued to you know, try to win the Stanley Cup again. Well, definitely, especially early on in your career there, uh, as you mentioned, you actually played in several cups with the Flyers, probably most notably against uh, the Edmonton Oilers, which had some great teams in the 80s for sure, with Wayne Gretzky and Mark Messier and countless others. Uh, do you have a particular favorite memories with those series itself in particular? Well, I know that in, in 1985 against the Edmonton Oilers, uh, we we had a number of guys that were hurt. Brad McCrimmon was out. Uh, Tim Kerr was hurt. Uh, we had a lot of guys really banged up and we only went five games with him that year. In 87, when we went back with Ron Hexel, he played tremendous goal for us, which really gave us a good chance to, to continue to keep in the series. We were down three games to one. To, came back to force a game seven. We uh, did score a power play goal early in the game, but Edmonton uh, just was too powerful of a team, and they came back to win that game three to one. Yeah, yeah. But like you said, powerful, powerful team throughout the whole decade there. But you guys definitely sure gave them some battles. Uh, but the interesting part was that same year of 87, you actually were fortunate enough to line up with Gretzky and Mario Lemieux in the Canada Cup. Uh, was that a good learning experience for you on the ice to play with two legends? 
Well, I, I think it's uh, much more than a learning experience. It was just was a great memory because that was the, the Canada Cup that was held up in Canada, and you had some of the best teams in the world that were participating in that from the different countries. And uh, it ended up being uh, the Canada against Russia in the final series, which was a uh, best of three series, which uh, normally you don't see that that often. And uh, losing the first game 6-5 in overtime, we had to come back to win the next two, which we did for Team Canada and uh, won the Canada Cup. So that was a tremendous memory. And uh, I think a lot of people that watched that hockey in those days uh, kind of looked at it as uh, some of the best hockey they had ever seen. That's for sure. Uh, as far as your particular career, because as we've been saying here so far, uh, the, your Flyer teams spent a lot of time in the playoffs. But uh, you in particular had a uh, serious issue with uh, Chris Chelios in the 89 playoffs. Uh, what, what can you tell us about that uh, particular incident? Uh, we had battled through a, first, a couple of series. It was the conference finals, and uh, in the first game, I came out of our zone and was passing the puck up to Rick Hawkins, and uh, Chelios came from behind, left his feet, elbowed me in the head into the stanchions, and I was knocked out, uh, missed uh, you know, most of that series. I came back for the final game, but uh, at that time, I was the uh, leading scorer in the playoffs, and uh, you know, I think that, uh, that that could have hurt our chances of getting back to the finals that year. Uh, well, do you feel... Uh, for the rest of your career there, that particular incident had uh, really affected your playing ability? No, because I came back and played uh, in that series. Yeah, yeah, and I mentally had you had to overcome getting uh, knocked out and, uh, and with a concussion, and you, you just had to realize that you've got a job to do, and you have to uh, you put everything aside and, and perform at your best level. So... Even though that was in '88, I still played for another seven years, and uh, you know, so that did not affect me. Uh, I think mentally and physically, I just was able to stay in good shape and to be able to understand that I had a job to do, and you can't just look back at something like that to detract you. Well, I do think it was definitely unique that issue because, you, like you, you see it more so in hockey because. Ron Hextall, who you mentioned a few minutes ago, and the rest of your team definitely seemed to uh, throw the bat for you after that particular incident with uh, Chelius. Why is that in hockey that if something happens to somebody, the team is the rest of the team is ready to die pretty much for you for their teammates? Well, I think that a, a lot of a lot of people grew up in Canada and, and in uh, families where you didn't have much, and so the the family values were were given to everybody. And you work hard for what you get, but you also, in a team sport, have to support your teammates. So I think that uh, what happens is that in hockey, you have a lot of uh, people that really understand that if, if you don't protect your teammates or play together as a unit, you're not going to win, and it's, uh, there's, there wasn't much movement in the 70s and 80s, so players used to play together for seven or eight years, which was kind of nice. Now there's more movement in hockey, and uh, it might be a little tougher to get that complete team feeling, but uh, I believe that back in the earlier days, uh, players stayed with the team a lot longer, and you, you learned how to play for the guy beside you, and that's how you became a winner. Well, you... They Next, uh, or excuse me, the two years from then, you ended up going to Minnesota and ended up back in the finals where you ended up losing to uh, your old uh, line mate there, uh, Mario Lemieux, in the finals. Uh, was that, well, how was that series for you? Well, I mean, I, the year before, when I uh, was traded from the Flyers in the late in the year of 91, uh, I went to Boston, and, and uh, you know, that was a good opportunity because Dave Poulin had been traded there earlier on in the year, and the two of us were able to go to the finals against Edmonton again with Boston, but unfortunately we uh, lost in that series, and me being a free agent, Bobby Clark was fired by the Flyers, and uh, he went to Minnesota and brought me on board with Minnesota along with Bobby Smith, brought in Bob Ganey as a coach, and they had a talented team, but I think they needed a couple of leaders that had been around for a while, and as a result, we uh, battled, the, you know, through some of the best teams in the league to end up getting into the finals against Mario Lemieux. But I believe that as the series went along, Mario Lemieux uh, sort of took it upon himself to get a little bit better. And as a result, uh, we lost in six games in that series. 
Yeah, pretty much Mario just being Mario for sure during that series. Well, I think he stepped it up, and one of the reasons that I think that uh, playing in the Canada Cup helped him was that he played with a lot of the top leaders from some of the other teams. And so winning the Canada Cup in 87 sort of uh, gave him an understanding of how you have, have to perform to get your team to win. And uh, I, I do believe that that did help him uh, when it came down to the Stanley Cup Finals in 91. Uh, okay, well, the... Last thing I want to ask about your particular career before we get into the lockout and everything else, uh, which many people may not realize, but Howie Mandel, the comedian, had a little bit of an influence on you and your uh, celebrations on the ice, correct? Well, that's that's for sure. Uh, Howie Mandel uh, used to go to Atlantic City every year and, and have a show, and, and during his show I was there with Scott McKay, a good friend of mine, and he did the guffaw, and in the English dictionary, that means a hearty laughter. So during a show, he said, hey, you guys want to mess up the next comedian that comes to town? And everyone's like, yeah, yeah. I said, well, when they say something funny, rather than clap, cheer, or whistle, everybody do this. And he did a hand movement, uh, you know, his right hand, and he did a little wave at the bottom, and then kind of arm straight up to the sky. And he said, guffaw. You know, guffaw, guffaw. You know, wouldn't that be funny if uh, that messed him up so... I uh, took that from the show, and when I met my, my friend on the beach patrol in Ocean City, I used to do guffaw rather than hello, and I figured that I needed more personality after I scored goals the following year, so I ended up uh, copying the guffaw after I scored goals, and that became my trademark. Yeah, it's funny, because you, you said you wanted a personality uh, on the ice, but I've been fortunate enough to meet a lot of athletes, a lot of celebrities over time, and... Hockey players, not just yourself, but hockey in general, they always seem to have the, the most personality uh, on and off the ice, that's for sure. Well, I think it's, a, it's part of life. Uh, you, you need to have a, a fun personality. You, you, you can't look at everything as all work. You have to uh, have some fun with what you're doing, and when you do that, it will help you perform better. Well, how would you say the game has changed since you have... Uh, Stop playing in 94 there. Well, I think that the, the money has changed things because it's more of a business. The, you have uh, more diverse uh, players playing from uh, all over the world on different hockey teams. You see that the players are moving around a little bit more because of the free agency. So I, I don't see them staying with the same team as, as long as, uh, it, as players did in the 70s and 80s. So I think that... You know, it's got to be a little harder on the fan base when uh, they've got a favorite player and then, you know, three years later they're gone and it's always replacing. So, you know, the, the hockey has been very good. I think that, uh, you know, that the world has really been watching and really appreciates hockey now. Uh, and uh, it's just that it's a kind of a shame that uh, players don't stay with one team a little bit longer. Well, unfortunately, like you said, things are uh, a lot more business side. And you uh, mentioned it at the, when we first uh, came on the air to take this uh, about the lockout. Do you, do you foresee hockey being played this year on a pro level? Well, I sure hope so. I know that the, the two sides have been meeting all week and uh, are up in New York, and I'm hoping that they can close any loopholes uh, and discussions that they have with the negotiations so that they can – maybe get started lay maybe middle of December and still have a half decent season. So I'm uh, you know, I'm hoping that they can get something accomplished this week and finalize something maybe before Thanksgiving so that uh, all the hockey fans that are out there can enjoy hockey this year. Yeah, because uh, if I remember correctly, this is uh, the third straight under Gary Bettman as commissioner. The first one, obviously, at the end of your career, we lost the 2004 season, the whole season, and now this year. So, which is a shame for the hockey fan, who is probably some of the most loyal sports fans of all, all the major sports. Well, I think that you have to you know, look at the issues on both sides, and uh, you know, they, they they've known what's been coming for a while. So, I was just more hopeful that they would have been better to prepare to. Uh, find a, a happy medium where everybody's going to be happy and uh, and get back out there and, uh, you know, keep the fan support going. 
Well, since you were a player and, you know, seen a lot, broadcaster and have seen so much in hockey, uh, would you say you're a guy that sides with the players or has the game changed so much on the business side you're not sure how to take it? No, I, I, I still will side with the players because, first of all, the percentage rates that uh, the owners were throwing at them was kind of ridiculous at the start. That seems to be back in more order now. Now the owners would like to have uh, more restrictive contracts. And, uh, you know, the players don't play that long. The length of a player is maybe four or five years. And, and I'm glad that they're making a little bit more money now so that they hopefully have some in their savings account for when they're finished to create and start new careers because you know, all the way through the 80s and by the end of the 90s, most players didn't have a lot of money that they were making, so uh, it's kind of difficult to make that transition to a business. Well, how was the transition for you uh, when you left the game as a player to going into the private sector as you are now? For me, uh, I was always sort of a business type person, and I had a lot of friends outside of hockey, and was able to uh, you know you go right into a couple of different businesses. Uh, I built a nice rink and ran the whole operation for three years before getting a chance to work with the Philadelphia Flyers on their radio for nine years. But even during that time period, I had also uh, done a, a few other uh, types of jobs in the in the off season and. Uh, when I, my children getting a little older, I didn't needed more of a regular job in the Philadelphia area. I decided to kind of uh, take a look at something different, and I'm thrilled to be with the Judge Group, uh, where you know, we help a lot of people find work, and we help a lot of companies through their technology staffing and training needs. Well, before we let you go, you mentioned it because obviously you stayed in the Philadelphia area, you played there, just everything, most of your adult life has been associated with Philadelphia. And from other people we've talked to who've played in that area, what is it about the Philadelphia area that when their athletes retire, the long-term athletes, they end up stick around that area? Well, because it's such a great city. The fan support is there. The, the players that play here have gotten – involved in the community events, and through that you've met a lot of people. There are a lot of great job opportunities for former athletes, and we love it here. It's a, a great city to be a part of and to live in and to work in. The opportunity is there to, for work, and that's why I think that you have a lot of the players that are still staying around and living here in the Philadelphia area. You, you fall in love with the city and, uh, and the people, and it's just, uh, you know, that's one of the best places in the world to live. And definitely you find it, like you said, you still have kids at home, like the school systems and just everything you would look at has been wonderful for you. Yeah, it's been it's been fabulous. And it's uh, just a, a great place to raise a family. And, and the school systems are great. The, you know, the city is great. We're, we're close to New York, to Washington, to Boston, and to Canada. I mean, we're, you know, we, we've got a great location and uh, we're close to the – Jersey Shores for some maybe some summertime fun activity. So uh, you know, I love being here, and uh, and I, I enjoy every every year that I'm here. Uh, well, final question about that topic before we let you go for this time. Uh, do you find that most of the fans that see you in the area out and about, whether you're out to lunch or working or whatever the case may be, are pretty respectful to you? Yeah, they're very respectable because I've been involved in community charities for the last 30 years. Most people already know me uh, as Brian. I mean, they, they know what type of a person I am. I'm no different than anybody else, and uh, I'm there to help uh, wherever I can to be a role model and to also participate in charity work. So for me, it's uh, it's more of a, a large base of uh, friendship people that I know than, uh, you know, than being a, a star athlete. Okay. Well, if there's any, uh, what's the best way for people to touch base with you if uh, people, fans want to touch base with you, Brian? The easiest way would be to go to my uh, brianprop.com website. I have uh, a lot of good work information on there, and I've got a lot of, uh, Hockey information on there, and there's a there's a spot to connect with me uh, through my website. So 
That would be the easiest way for anybody to get a hold of me. Brian, thanks a lot, and we'll talk to you soon. All right. Sounds good. Thanks. Have a great afternoon. You too. Bye-bye.